Okay, the first seat on the left of the uh, moderator is the hardest because you are first. So I'm Tomasz Gadomski. I'm legal expert at 11-bit studios. And before that, I used to work for production companies, Polish-based ones. And apart from all of that, I have a class and a lecture on management of intellectual property. So this is me. Hi, I'm David Greenspan. I won't change my background since the last time I spoke, but I do have a movie background. I started actually in the movie industry, low-budget film studio, so in the morning I would draft contracts. In the afternoon I was told that I have to act in a film, very low bar. Uh, I just had to be able to breathe, and I was qualified for the film, and I've been in the industry for about 30 years in the video games. Well, 30 years, yeah, 30 years in the video game space, uh, working in business legal affairs, and now I've been teaching uh, video game law uh, to law students and undergraduates. Hi, I'm Riley Russell. I, uh, I head up uh, the U.S. studio for Kojima Productions. Uh, it sounds impressive, but it's me and another person. It's not very big. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I am a lawyer um, by background, and I'm a lawyer when needed at, at Kojima Productions, but I'm not the head lawyer. I was the head lawyer at Sony PlayStation for about 30 years, and before that I was at Sega, so that's what I've been up to in the past. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for those presentations. Maybe I am also present myself. My name is Michal Matysiak from Rimash Zort Marutalo Firm. Uh, I'm senior associate in video games department and today I have the opportunity to take part in this panel as, as a humble moderator to those all stars from gaming and uh, movie industry. Uh, today we have a really interesting topic about movie adaptations of video games. It's a really complex uh, subject with uh, lots of uh, details and uh, issues to uh, to discuss, so maybe we start with a little uh, warm-up and uh, discuss briefly approach of both industry towards each other. For example, whether you think it's like a clash of the worlds or maybe it's like total, uh, total understanding. Do you think that uh, have this uh, changed during the days? Because, w of course, uh, uh, you have a lot of experience from from your work, so 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 maybe you share share some some uh, initial comments comments on that. Maybe uh, maybe Tomas, maybe you want to start. Of course I do. <laughs> so basically, what I want to present is Polish perspective. We are a Central European market that has entered with bang game industry. Uh, I believe we placed fifth in the WIPO report as a value of trademarks regarding video games. So this is what we are talking about, fifth in the world. And But apart from that, we are a country that is approached by international media uh, with money. There is no money in um, uh, adaptations of movies. There is no funding, uh, adaptations of games. There is no huge funding in that in government, in public funding. So basically what a developer is faced to do is to either approach someone from the local market, which are big companies, or expand further. So the main problem regarding adaptations of uh, video games are the rights, of course. And if we are facing a Polish market, then the big players, big fish in the pond. And I will, won't say any name, but we are aware what fish are those, string services uh, mostly. They have incredible ask for all rights. If they are to do a deal with you, they basically ask for everything. So it's a deal with the devil. So actually more uh, wise people than me at 11 Meet Studios, thought that the best thing is to uh, reach out, up, uh, out of Poland, basically out of Europe, and present RIP to other markets that maybe have other rules of playing the game of movie adaptations. 
Thank you, thank you for, for, for that comment. Maybe we have some kind of uh, point of uh, view from 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 United States. Uh, maybe maybe David already want some share some 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 light of what 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 you think about uh, about relation between movie at the, uh, between movie industry and games industry. Okay. Uh, I think it first of all needs to be broken down into two parts. So the first part, which has been the traditional part, where video games back in the 1980s had a relationships with film studios where they acquired the, license, the film and that was the basis of the game. Because you really couldn't distinguish one game from the other back in the 1980s. They all looked the same, whether it was Alien, whether it was E.T., blah, blah, blah. So you, you're basically marketing the, your game by putting that brand, the movie title, onto it and hoping that people see E.T. and they're going to buy it, although that's another story uh, regarding the video game industry. So that has been the traditional way things have moved. Uh, and it still happens today, and we'll probably talk about where it's, where it's evolved. And then the other thing to think about is that we are now seeing more movie studios interested in video game properties. Now, that existed back in the 1990s, but there were very few films. They weren't very successful, with the exception of maybe Mortal Kombat and Tomb Raider. And now we're seeing that evolve substantially, where there are a lot of fantastic movies, te television shows, based on video games. So the pendulum, to some degree, has been going back and forth. But now you have those two opportunities where the video game industry and the, and the film industry work together. And we'll talk about how that has changed over the years. Yeah, I'll just give my little two cents. There's been a, in my oh, course of my career, there's been this huge sea change. Because it was, it used to be, we used to license from them to us. Um, and they, you know, they were the top dog in entertainment. And they acted that way, and they still do to some extent. But they, I remember one of the first uh, movie deals I worked on coming into a video game was uh, Frankenstein, the De Niro Frankenstein. And uh, they wouldn't even show us what the monster looked like until about a month before the movie, which is impossible when you're building a video game. Uh, it has since changed. There's a couple reasons for it. But at this, you know, one of the reasons is the box office, uh, the, the level's going down, and you know the uh, Streaming is rising, so they need new content. Um, they've run out of comic books, frankly. And so they're trying to get everything they can for games. But what's happened over the course of the, la the last 30 years is we've become what I consider to be the top dog. And they still want to do business their old way, which is very much everything. You know, We want everything. And I think it's time we change that, frankly. And I think it is changing to some it is degree, changing. and we'll, we'll talk about that That's uh, during the discussion. Talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, d definitely. Now we're living in very interesting times uh, when, like the uh, the place of the power is is shifted. I I believe now, uh, gaming industry is uh, is going up and up, and movie industry have some some troubles. So 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 definitely, it's a uh, it's uh, it's 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 a time when uh, when our industry uh, may sometimes uh, take a lead role in in, in in some 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 productions but maybe because uh, maybe uh, I provide you with some sneak peek about what we uh, will discuss in a, in a minute because uh, for example Riley prepared some really uh, really uh, detailed summary for example of some some deals between uh, those two industries but now maybe I want to a little bit change the perspective because we know that, uh, that this event is uh, targeted especially for companies from C uh, region but also for, for, for investors outside of, uh, of this region. And I believe it's, it's, a, it's a big deal always for, uh, for game studios to uh, participate in, in deals like, uh, like that. And there's a lot of uh, new things to, to learn quickly and to, to, to think about that. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe you, Tomas, share some, uh, some of your experience from, from those deals, from like Polish perspective of making deals with, uh, for example, uh, American studios or other from, from, from different jurisdiction than the Polish one. Okay, so before working at, uh, at 11-bit studios, 
and production companies. I was a lawyer at uh, Platish Image, uh, who owned the rights to the Witcher adaptation of uh, of the book, not of the game. You, we have to keep in mind that the book and uh, the the game is a different IP based on the book, and the TV series is different IP based on on the book as well. So Platish Image uh, has held the option to turn the book into the TV series. And we were, it was like more, more or less 10 years, 10 years ago. So actually we were going blind. Like we, no one, we ca had in mind the previous adaptation of The Witcher, which basically lacked founding and we wanted to avoid that. So we knew that there is no business partner for us in Poland. So we reached out and we reached out to the United States on our own, own. So this was then when I was learning how to make business with the United States. And this is a very different approach than Polish because in Poland we have to have everything in writing. And actually the agreement has to have 20 pages. And well, we have to have everything set in paper, like how many episodes, how many series, who will be executive producer, who will direct, uh, how many prequels, how many sequels. And this is not, I believe, how it's done in other countries. Yeah. So luckily for, uh, uh, for 11 Bit Studios, I have learned from my mistakes. Uh, this deal with Netflix uh, back then was so devastating that after it was signed, the deal memo, I uh, changed the job. <laughs> <laughs> I was fed up with dealing with them. Uh, but yeah, so the main problem back then was the problem of uh, not knowing the culture of doing business with United States and how those deals should look like. So this was the main problem. And the other one was that we tried to do everything on our, our own. Of course, we had legal counsel, but it was like typical legal counsel, uh, not business-wise. So that's why we made some, not mistakes, but we had needed time to learn and grow for our mistakes. The, the, the definition of long-form agreement, I think, came from the movie industry because many deals are initially done with a deal memo where the principal terms are discussed. And then you get to the long-form agreement. Uh, 75 pages, maybe? 80 pages? And the, the net revenue well, runs, runs 22 pages. Right, and I, and I pretended to read that clause, and I have a movie background, and look at it this way. So the net definition was 22 pages. It cost me more to have a lawyer review just the net definitions than the amount of money that I was receiving for the option agreement. So it's kind of ridiculous, and you know, a lot ends up being bargaining power. And we are seeing a shift with that because of the success of recent games turned into movies. But it all comes down really to leverage. You know, how good is your property? How many companies really want your property to actually make a film? Which, by the way, we've been talking about this. It is very difficult to turn a property into a movie. It can take many years and a lot of frustrations and a lot of projects don't even get made. That's the Hollywood model. So these agreements can be very long. They want to grab all the rights they possibly can. And I think we'll talk about the precautions that you need to take in yeah. the event uh, a studio is interested in acquiring rights. Uh, so yeah, probably 70 pages. And then there's an appendix that's about 30 pages asking you to deliver the following goods to them, which is primarily a chain of title, which I think Riley is going to talk about. So it can be a really challenging process. And there are a number of agreements that need to get signed even before what's called a film gets green lit by the studio to move forward with it. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely. Yes, definitely. We, we have another microphone, oh, yeah. just for you, Riley. And I think it's okay. a good good time to maybe sh uh, start with uh, with this summary. You think? Yeah, we can start with the summary. I, I think it is my summary doesn't include the difference between the short form and the long form. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and that, that's okay, but one, one, I'm going to try and tell you what little tricks I've learned along the way. And if there's movie lawyers in here, they're going to hate me. And, and hopefully the game <laughs> movies will like it. But I don't want to suggest that we have more, necessarily more leverage, because that's going to only come from how good your IP right. is and how many people want it. Because they're making the movies, they're the ones in investing it, and you really can't, um, you know, you can't really drive them to make your movie any more than they want to. However, there are things you need to be mindful of when you're negotiating the deal because it's super easy to give away way too many rights that they don't knew, need but they won't will want to take along the way. So um, starting with the short form, one of the first things I do, if we can make that smaller, so maybe we can, oh, we don't have anybody here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like may, maybe get all the pages on here. But on the short form, I always try, they always try to make them non-binding and I try to get the important terms and make them binding in the short form. Um, that's the first thing I do because then when they get the long form and it says something completely different, I just go, oh, but wait a minute, you agreed in the short form. And they always want to give you everything at the beginning. They'll tell you how wonderful they are, how much they care for your property, and you know, they're going to take great care of you. So get as much as you can up front. And another important point is understand what your client wants. If you're doing it for the money, you know, quite frankly, it's like that's David said, that's probably a mistake. If you're doing it for the, the, you know, the expansion of your IP, to bring it to people that have never played the game, that's what I think most people in the video game interest, I industry are looking for. If you're looking for a bump in sales, it probably isn't going to be as much as you'd expect from the film. And of course, the film never comes out at the time when you want the film and game to come out together because you're on totally different time schedules when you're building these things, even though they promise otherwise. So the basic deal um, is like this, basically. It has, it'll always have two 18-month options. Um, and that's basically the time that they get to decide whether they really want to make it. They'll be writing it. They'll get a writer. They'll start attaching people. And they'll almost always ask for a third or a fourth option. Um, the second thing is there's a purchase price, and this is what I really struggle with because every movie deal says a purchase price, and the mentality there is they're buying your IP, and it really should just be a license. We're just licensing this for the movie, and so I think it becomes really critical, um, and this is how they typically read. The IP owner, us, assigns and sells to purchaser exclusively, exclusively in perpetuity and throughout the universe, all the right title and interest in the property. Now, you can't sign that. And yet, my sister company at Sony sent me this language. I'm like, what the, you know, you, know, you can't do it. Um, and so that'll come, so you gotta be very mindful of it. To get around it, you're not gonna get them to change the word purchase price. But what you're gonna be able to do is say, the purchase price is I, you're purchasing the right to produce a film, or the purchase price, you know, very narrow exclusion. They'll try to define this the purchase price is I'm buying your property. Don't let them. <laughs> Define it as the purchase price is, let, is to allow them to make a film, maybe only one, based on my property. Um, there'll be a, per excuse me. I was just going to make a comment that based on that language that they sent you, they can make video games. They can make any, oh no, absolutely. Yeah, they can make anything they wanted. You've just turned over their rights. And that's, yeah, and that's it's really popular because we also have uh, some kind of experience with those type of trying to describe purchase points. So it's, it, it happens, yeah, so you need to think about that. Yeah, and what they, you know, the, if you're lucky enough to get past that, they will take, in my experience, been, I get, try to get them to get the uh, production op option. They will want to have it forever, to be able to produce a movie over and over and over again for as long as, you know, forever, and never let anybody else do it. I always, and it'll later down, down the list, there's a reversionary clause, and I always insist that at some point in time, I don't care if it's two years, one year, three years, 30 years, it's all coming back to me. And I always make sure there's something that will trigger that somehow, some way, because I don't want them to hold my IP forever. And I think that's very important to go through. Um, I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but the sort of the little things. So I always try when I start, because I want everybody, I want it to have it be a good experience, I want it to be win-win. I always say, I try to negotiate personally, one film and two sequels, you know, and then we can talk afterwards. If you want, you know, if we're doing really well and we can get to 25, God love you, I'll happily do that. But it's, you know, I've never reached 25 yet, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really hard to reach one, you know. It's, I've only had one or two, I've had three video games come out with uh, movies that I've done the deals on and probably 
seven or eight that have never come out. So, you know. Um, another thing they'll do is they'll ask you for a chain of title. It's fair enough, it seems like. They want to know that you own it. But most of us, if we've created the IP, there's very little to have to put up in a chain of title. But I've always found that they hold, use this to add extra time to the, you know, the, what they, they, don't, they, they don't bring it up until the long form. And because they don't bring it up to the long form, you're probably into this thing for six to nine months. They have two 36, two 18 month options and they just added another eight, eight or nine months onto because then they ask you for the chain of title. So it's kind of a way of getting an extra year. So one of the first things I do is go, okay, we're gonna do a deal. What do you want for a chain of title? Because we own it, I'll get it for you. I'll send it to you tomorrow so we don't have to worry about that triggering or not. Um, and they love to extend the time on, you know, just use it to extend time. I need to scroll this thing. I don't know how to do that. So, yeah. Would you do yeah. We need I don't to have too much time here. Well, um, these are good topics. Since we're talking about okay, so approval. They don't want really want you to approve, have approval rights of everything. They'll give you meaningful consultation, which I really don't understand what it means because they seem to ignore it in the process. <laughs> um, uh, where you can, what I try to do is I try to be going in, I try to get approval over certain uh, facets of it. Like I say, I always tell the guys in the studio, what is it you don't want to have happen in your game? You know, tell me the things that you, you know, you, the characters can't change or, or you know, maybe they can't smoke or they can smoke or you'd say, well, tell me what you want them to do. We'll get that. Tell me, you know, that we, we they have to, we make them stick to the main characters. Uh, Things like that, but I identify a few things, and as you're going in, usually the movie company will agree to that. Sequel rights, this is the one that really fries me. For some reason, whatever they pay you, and I'm gonna use, let's use a million dollars as the amount they're gonna pay you. Um, the, oh, by the way, the purchase options, if, we, if it was a million dollar deal, probably you get $250,000 for the first option, $250,000 for, $250, for the second, maybe a million for the production price, for some reason, the, one of those two options is ap applicable against the purchase price, which means you're getting you know, one right. payment less than what it, you know, I don't know why they do that. They always do it though. So they just always take out, you know, take it away from you after they pretend to give it to you. Uh, then on the sequel rights, they always come back and they want to pay you less money for the sequel. And I've never understood this because, let's see, you've made a movie, it's working, you're successful, you want to do another one, and now you're going to pay me half of what you paid me for the first movie. Makes no sense to me. Push back uh, is my attitude on that one. Uh, then there's, if, you're, if they haven't taken everything from you, <laughs> the ownership and everything else, they'll try to freeze rights. And, you know, I probably shouldn't name a specific title, but they'll, they want every right they possibly can. And I was doing the God of War license, um, and they wanted musical theater rights. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's crazy, you know, and they wanted to freeze the musical theater rights. I said, no, it's not gonna do that. Yeah, but maybe I have one comment on that, sure. uh, about uh, those rights related, for example, to, to, uh, to theaters. And for example, sometimes they refer only, for example, for, uh, for Broadway, et cetera. And they totally forgot about other, for example, yeah. uh, ways of uh, reproduction of your work. Yeah. Uh, May I have a question? Because uh, it is credits is the end of your presentation, or are you going to have something more? I don't know if there's more. There's a little bit more. Okay, there. because what I'm missing is actually uh, because what I can see, and this is what I actually encounter during my work, uh, is uh, the fact that basically companies think still the old way. So they think that they are buying scenario of a book or That's a scenario right. that is going to. Used to be a screenplay, so what I don't know whether what's uh, what's uh, more in your in your presentation, but what I'm missing is uh, something. Uh, it's merge. Oh, uh, it's coming. It's, it's coming. coming. Okay. Yeah. Shall I wait or ask my question now? Uh, you can do either way. <laughs> okay, so I will wait then. Okay. Well, uh, and I don't want to cover everything, but reversion. This is where I always. This is where I get harsh because I the other things. You know, because we're not really worried about making money sometimes. I, I always insist, I always insist they pay me at least as much on the first, second one as the first right. one. Absolutely. But you're going to, it's whatever you negotiate. You really, you shouldn't be thinking you're going to make a lot of money on these things. <laughs> um, but I always say, insist somewhere to build in a reversion because they will ask, and this just fries me beyond belief, 
that not only, they, if they're going to produce a film, they do the first option, the second option, they write a script, usually a script comes out during that time, but then they want to freeze everything up until you pay them back. And they actually charge interest on wanting to be paid back. If that's the standard language. Right. Well, that that's if the reversion occurs. That, if the so, reversion you're, so you're getting the rights back because the options have expired. Absolutely. But my feeling is, is you didn't make the right. movie. That's not my problem. Oh, oh, so, the, it's so even worse actually in Poland. The, what they offer, yeah, what they offer you is you can buy back the right, yeah. and then you add the sum they spent on development. So right. no, it's not only interest. You you need to buy back all of it, like yeah. all of the 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 money they paid to develop the scenario yeah. of a movie that never happened. It's so, crazy. It's so the, but but the thinking behind that is is that another studio may all of a sudden show interest, and therefore they would be willing to pay that price. But I agree with you that it's insane. Well, but Forrest Gump, for example. Uh, bit older, uh, older movie, but that went through a number of studios that rejected that film and the reversion rights would kick back in for any cost that the first studio incurred. So these that's are the things the, I think that's a fair argument if they use the same script. Yeah. But the yeah. problem is, is the first draft they send you is not going to say, if you use my script, right. it's right. going to say, right. if you want your property back, <laughs> You pay me, and you pay everything on top of it, which is and no. <laughs> that's know, an old, like, Hollywood, no, 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 no. <laughs> old Hollywood tradition, but yeah. perhaps if the leverage exists for companies, maybe they can push back on that. Yeah. I, I did want to ask I've you about I've never had a problem. I, I, I always push back. They always go. You know, they seem shocked, and I can't really believe they're that shocked. But I've always gotten it that they, at least I always get it down to if we use the same script, whoever uses it next, we'll, you know, right. we're not going to make the movie on their comment. script. The, the, you talked about the options, though. I'm very surprised that they would pay you $250,000 on a million dollar purchase because a lot of options, some of the studios even say free option, free oh, yeah. option. Oh, well, that's and then others, others typically could be five to ten to fifteen thousand dollars for an option and so understand that during the option period it's very possible that the studio says we're not proceeding, that's all the money well, you get for, and, and for the deal. And may, what may or may not uh, influence how much you get paid is if you deal with a production company the production company will offer you exactly the same deal as the studio will do it, but they'll only pay you a small amount of money because they're going to go try and sell, sell it to it, the right. bigger studio. Uh, and then when, once they get the money, they're happy to pay you. But, right. Yeah. And so why do, why do we even have option agreements? Because the studios are looking for a number of properties during the course of the year. Maybe they get hundreds of these that they put out options yeah. for, so they don't want to pay a lot. But their thinking is, is that during this option period, well, someone in the studio or a producer liked the script, but maybe no one else likes the script. And what they're trying to do is get funding for that film, get actors, directors, and other people associated with the project. And once they have those people associated with the project, then most likely they're going to get funding if those people are successful. And then they decide, OK, well, let's move to the next step. We'll elect that option and then consider the purchase price. Which is all fair and good. but. They, if they're not successful, right. I shouldn't have to pay for it. Right. Yeah, that's why, I, because all of that that you have said, David, the gestation period of a TV series or movie is 10 years. Like, really, this is it. Like, this is what, if we are talking about expanding our IP, this is how, how long may it take, because the first option may not work, the next one as well. And then, if we are really trying to expand our IP, we have to be patient about all of that. You have to be very patient. I did the Uncharted uh, license, if you want to call it, took 12 years from the time I did that. We had done five, uh, we, we started, we did the license on Uncharted 1. We had done five sequels by the time the movie was made. <laughs> you know, and so we had made probably a billion dollars in revenue before they finally made the so movie. The, but that's an interesting question. So let's sit, say it takes you seven years to do yeah. that property and you've made subsequent <clears throat> versions of that game. Do all those new versions now fall under these rights it depends on how you write the definition of property. And oh, and, and I have, yeah, and I have w one more question because, you know, and this is, this may be theoretical as a, a practical question as well because we own, as a living beat, a uh, name, uh, Frostpunk is, is, is a game in our portfolio. Suppose we sign a deal and we value our IP on, I don't know, $100,000 option. And then, we are actually about to release a sequel, 
Frost Bank 2. So the IP as a whole may be stronger and the option is for three years. So actually, we should take that into account if we are releasing a sequel, that as well, the brand may be stronger. That's why we should be paid more for the option. Yeah, I, you know, again, I've been lucky enough. I'm, we're not really worried about the money as, as more of the expansion of the IP, but I agree with you. And I typically do, um, in negotiations, if I know a sequel's coming, we usually include it because it takes so long for the movie to come out that the game comes out before that, and so it seems silly to have a movie based on only the first game. Now, another thing you need to be thinking about, and I think this is absolutely critical, is that maybe, you know, a video game is 60 to 100 hours of play. Um, in Death Stranding, we have, it, uh, the story is about the seventh, you know, event that caused extinction around the world. Well, that means there were six before. And I'm not licensing those previous six or seven, you know, seven I'm giving you, but eight, nine, and ten I'm going to withhold. And you got to think of in, the, in like, Marvel Universe, uh, you know, do you want one person to do it all or do you want multiple people to do many, many stories that you may produce? So you have to think about that also. Um, yeah, maybe I have one, one uh, another comment to, yeah. to this topic. Because I, I think uh, that in this type of contract, like between a uh, gaming industry and video industry, there is one thing that always missing and sometimes it's really bothered me why. Like, this is uh, the topic of like cross licensing the IP. For example, I develop your IP, so you gave me, for example, license, etc. Or maybe you need to like clearly describe like the uh, borders of property. Uh, of course, as you said, usually it works like this. For example, if I'm if I'm a movie company and produce uh, a movie, I, I don't give you nothing. You, f of course, you can buy a license for me. Or of course, you can, for example, uh, we can talk about other cooperation agreement in that regard, but uh, but it's not like in the first version of the draft. And it's really bothered me why. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a money talk, but uh, probably it's something that should be should be obvious. Of course, there is some, uh, some probably strategic issues about that, but maybe uh, maybe you have some experience with that. Maybe maybe it's, it's not so rare, but I found it really rare after my, uh, my, uh, my, my projects that, that I was able to, to, to work with, yeah. I'm not sure what the question is. Question, yeah. Yeah, yeah question is about cross-licensing and whether it's, uh, it's often t in, in the contracts like, like this, so to put it really clear. Not doing like the li when you say cross, doing cross with what? With the Between right. movie, uh, movie company and so game company. So who has the licensing rights maybe to merchandise? Is that yeah, what you're Yeah, probably, about? yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll get there a little bit later as But we I do have, this. you you brought up an interesting issue, at least for me, yeah. for IP. So the movie studio creates a film based on the video game. Yep. They expand that universe. Maybe they create a new character. I have that coming up under what things we should ask for. Then I'm waiting yeah. for this. Okay. Because they don't put in what's good for us. They put in what's good for them, and they leave a lot of things out, in my opinion. And I'm not well liked in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, can, can I, yeah, please. So where are we? Um, merchandise. George Lucas screwed this up so bad for everybody. Because <laughs> <laughs> somebody forgot to get the merchandising rights to the studio. And you end up, I've argued more about merchandising rights and I've never seen any merchandise come out from any of the movies that have even been produced, you know. And, uh, uh, but you will spend a lot of time with it. They want the merchandising rights. Typically what happens is you kind of split the game merchandising, which you just go ahead and do whatever you're doing with the game. They then have movie merchandising, which I've, like I said, I've done multiple movie deals. I've never seen any significant merchandising coming out of them. It's not like the old days, you know, or it's, you know, but if you're lucky enough to have merchandising, obviously you want to participate in it. Uh, I, we get into negotiations over when things can be released, uh, who is the licensing agent. They always want to control it all. I sort of believe that you should give it the opportunity if you, you know, if I'm doing a, ga a game, and I have somebody doing the merchandise for me. I always put in a clause. They don't have to use them, but maybe the first uh, right of negotiation goes to the people who are already doing the merchandise. And I've been able to get away with that. And I think that's, you know, I think it's just good business. Do business with people that you're happy with. Yeah, uh, but really often, uh, if we're thinking about merchandising, there is a lot of, like, uh, really not clear costs that, for example, make make like for 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 for, uh, for game development studio make their pay really like for example 
percent of, of like the whole whole amount of money that that the, for for example this company that produce uh, produce uh, this for example toys etc merch uh, uh, gave from the market so uh, it's I, I believe it, it is a big problem about those clothes that it's uh, it's it's not really way to, to make money on, on if, the contract. If I may chip in, actually George Lucas even shaped the scope of these digital dragons because I have attended this, uh, this afternoon a very interesting panel of, by an artist, of how to create a creature within the game to expand your IP. So how to create a creature in that in mind that it will be uh, sold as an item. And for me, and I will use a real example, but okay, so this is a real example of a game, but of course the background is given by me, so it's fictional. So we are having in development a game that is called Creatures of Ava. There is a plenty of possibilities to transfer. It's about a girl like catching creatures in a good way. Yeah. So this is a plenty of, there is a plenty of room, first of all, to design those creatures as a sellable items. Then there is another plenty of room for someone you know, because they may pick and choose if they have the license, the studio, of what creatures they will adapt and what creatures will they add. So, first of all, how do we monetize the thing that actually is sold by us, 11-bit studios, as a toy already, and then the sales are bumped by the movie that uses the same creature as a character. So this is one thing. Another thing is that how and on what terms they can develop their own creatures with our, with our universe and sell them. Yes, yeah. that, that is something that that's you have to think about. And yeah. Yeah, that's when I get to the, you know, what our concerns are, because those are never in the contract when you're right. going, coming in, you know. So, uh, and that's, he's absolutely right. You have to think about that stuff. And, and by the way, those are the things you should also be thinking when you have a developer-publisher deal, when the publisher wants to be the merchandiser of your properties, are they allowed to do it? Do they have the capabilities to do that? What's the royalty rate? So forth and so on, and similar to the studios. And if you have a big enough IP, you can, you know, and they want it bad enough, you can say no new characters. Right. Um, maybe you want to add new characters, and that's something that, you know, if, if you have a great partner, you go back and forth, and the creatives, you know, make something better. But, you, you know, the lawyers have to think about the worst case. And going in, everybody loves each other, I guarantee you. Before the contracts, everybody loves each other. And then about six months in, they hate each other because they don't see eye to eye. It absolutely happens. Uh, I'm going to point out something on release dates. You're never going to get a, you know, a release in a certain amount of time. But what I do is I trigger both. The option periods just have a natural period of which they run. I actually try to get shorter option periods for less money because I want to have more control over the, the process. But that's whatever you want to negotiate. I do tie, though, and if they don't make it in a certain amount of time, and it's usually seven years, just because of the way movies, the timing they work, uh, then it all comes back. And each sequel is the same thing. I have basically a five to seven year structure. And I've been able to, I've been able to manage to you know, get that put in place. If I can't get the, uh, the you know, I like to do th only three to is the max, but you know, there's a lot of pushback on that. So then I say, okay, fine, but if you ever go out more than seven years, it's all coming back. That's where I catch it. Um, then we get down to what I would consider the game issues, which are things like new characters, which is what happens and who owns it. Um, I first start off with anything that goes into the game, any story, even the music. Uh, I want to be able to, I mean, done the game, in the movie, whatever's in the movie, I get to use in my game royalty free. And surprisingly, they take that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I have said I had some arguments that where they say, well, you know, if it's a, it becomes a, a game in and of itself, the character becomes a game in and of itself, we'd like to share in that royalty. And I think that's not unfair. Right. You know, but that depends on how you think. You could say, no, it's my property. It wouldn't exist but for, you know, for you uh, making the movie. But that's where I kind of balance that out. I've also had some cases where uh, we can use the character but not as a, you know, a... Um, a major character. They can come in and do like cameos and stuff uh, because they're making the movie after the game so it's not like I'm going to put them back into the game. So there's that. Uh, same with the storylines. Uh, and what I've done in my more recent deals is I'm making the, us a co-producer because then I think I'll actually get some, potentially get some money or actually get more control over the whole thing. Uh, themes and environments. You know, if they place the, your game in a different world you're going to make the next game in their world. You, I ask for everything to come back. 
And the music, usually because it's going to be licensed, I ask just if they're going out and licensing music, they give me an opportunity to also license the music at the same time because we get music at the, you know, you don't want to have to buy music after the fact that it's been used. Um, and what I worry constantly about, although it's never happened, is what happens if a piece of music becomes so associated with the product that you have to take it? Right. You know, like a James Bond thing. It, it could happen. There's no reason it couldn't happen. TV uh, shows is a good example for that. Yeah. Okay, and uh, can we scroll one more time? And what else do we have? Um, oh, uh, yeah, all these others are pretty much straightforward. Uh, financial, can, like I said, David uh, was talking about how big they are. Literally, the net revenues pages in the Columbia uh, contract runs 22 pages, and that's the standard terms. And they will try to stick into the short form. We will do, you know, subject to the standard terms. And I'm like, no, no, give me the standard terms. Because now. they always say that. They, it, and my feeling on the net revenues clause, even though it runs 22 pages, it comes down to net, net, nothing. You're going to get <laughs> zero, you know. Um, and the one thing I always start with... Uh, in every negotiation, before I begin talking at all, as I say, I'm not going to share any revenue from the video game with you. And if we have to, if you're going to raise that again, we'll just stop discussions. Because they will try. They will tell the, you that because their movie's going to be so good, they deserve 5% or something. Or that they want, and you say, no, you can't have that. The next thing they'll say is, I want a, whatever the bump in sales are. Right. And I say, no to that. So that's sort of uh, where it all starts. Now, there's a lot more to this, but that's sort of a quick primer. And I, uh, thank you for putting up with that. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I have one yeah. one other uh, area that we maybe should discuss in, in relation to agreements like this because I, I believe it was not like explicitly covered. It's like creative control of game dev studios over over movies. And uh, I I would really write uh, really appreciate your uh, your comments on that topic and probably uh, for example, you can uh, let us example what amount of control, for example, a uh, game dev studio could uh, could ask for in deals like that. Because we know for the movie company, of course, uh, lower is better, of course. But maybe you have some comments on that. Well, I, I just want to make some introductory remarks on that. Because from my perspective, what I would do, I would, would divide the... Uh, the game, because you know we are talking a game as a whole, but different games have different gameplays. Yeah. So I imagine that if we have a character-driven gameplay, then we should, as a studio, have full control of, for example, the story, how it turns, because it may affect future uh, installments of our game. But if we have, if the gameplay is based, for example, on on, I don't know, city building or its strategy game or whatever, when there is more space for that, there is something, I believe, a space for discussion, but still it should, shouldn't turn, uh, overturn the whole idea of the world with, uh, with what is going to be a movie or TV series. Yeah, I, I agree. It, you know, it depends on what you, IP you have going in, how much the movie might affect it, uh, how much they want it is always... But you know, they're going to spend a lot of money. They, you know, they, in the movies that I've made, uh, worked with, they've probably spent, you know, 30 to $100 million. And that's a big investment. And I understand when they say, look, we can't have you hold it up after a certain point. So I get the, the in, up front, like I said before, the character can be this, this, and this, but it can't be this, this, and you can't, you know, can't smoke, it can't do this, whatever. It can be, you can have the, have it, you know, this world, you can have it in, uh, set it in Mexico, you can set it in, you know, Australia, but you can't set it in the Antarctic, or if, if that's what's important to you, and get those things identified, because then they can say, okay, then we get, usually we ask for script approval, and beyond that, it's just, we get to consult and we get to talk to them, but they win once they actually go into principal photography, because you can't stop it at that point. You know, up, up front, you can deal with the script, um, we try to get, you know, the uh, approval of the lead actor and actresses, which is sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You're never going to probably get who you want anyway, so you're going to have to kind of give and take. But you might want to have a really, you know, if it's somebody who's just not the right person, you might want to have a veto power, but it's hard to get. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were up for the lead in Uncharted. I remember that. We had to bounce you. 
disappointing. It's a bit ironic because the movie studios argue with the video game companies that you can only have maybe script approval. We need to see everything. We're investing all this money. It needs to be under our control. Yeah. Well, in the last few years, video games are costing 30 to $100 million, and yet the studios will say, we need to approve everything regarding that video game. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah, that, exactly. that's where we've gone. <laughs> You're just asking for whatever their approval language is. When they license <laughs> exactly. We'll flip be happy it. to take that. Yeah. yeah, just flip it. Yeah, and maybe maybe one, one comment on that, because we know that nowadays a lot more good uh, good movies based on the games uh, come out in uh, uh, in theaters. Uh, I believe s still the statistic is on the favor of the bad movies, but because it's 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 matter of the of the history. So probably uh, probably do you like think that this is something that you need to take into consideration as a game dev developer that, for example, bad movie can influence your future. Like the your legacy, the future of your IP, or maybe do you think that is that is something that it's only like, for example, marketing tool, some kind of, uh, and it really doesn't matter in doing business. I'll let you guys feel that if you want. Well, I think it affects it, but at the end of the day, it's probably not a big or a bad bump to the video game companies if the movie does poorly. So the video game companies want to make sure that good actors, a good director, X amount of dollars are going to be spent on the movie because the higher the amount, typically that would mean that there's a better production value. And they're also going to put marketing dollars behind the film. And so that, that can be advantageous uh, for the video game companies. But I forgot what the other point I was going to say, so I'll, let, I'll either let you two guys talk yeah, and then I'll jump yeah, back My in. experience <laughs> is it doesn't really, if you have a good game, it doesn't really hurt the game right. sales. If it's a bad movie, it just sort of disappears after a week or two. Um, on the other side, if it's a really good movie, it doesn't help that much either. Because it usually is a good game and a good movie and, you know, it doesn't, and because they don't come out too close together. I mean, I've never had one come out close together that it was too late. By the time the movie came along, it didn't make any difference. In the, you know, you get a little bump in sales, but not anything significant if the game's been out, you know, five years. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter. Actually, I have an example of my own experience. There, there was a movie that I have watched recently, and I was hesitating to see that. And this was the, it's not a movie based on game, but a, but a game mechanics. It's the Dungeons and Dragons movie. And this was, a for me, as, as, as a viewer, it was a very interesting example because Dungeons and Dragons is such a great uh, area of, uh, and so everybody who has, everyone who has touched Dungeons and Dragons has a different idea how it works in his mind. So confronting that with a movie could be difficult for the production company. And that's why I hesitated, because I have played Dungeons & Dragons games. And actually, I believe it went well. Not because of the history. They didn't adapt any of the history of the books, as far as I know, or the games. But what they did, they actually hired likable characters, likable actors, uh, with Hugh Grant, I believe, as well as the, the bad one. Sorry for spoiling. So, uh, s and what because apart from all those provisions we have in the agreement what we should have in mind is that this company this production company of course wants to have as much money as can get from IRP, but they don't want the adaptation to fail it's in their business so what we need apart from all of those provisions some uh, some trust that they are willing to not to spoil RRP, just they want to as well earn profits from that. In my experience, that when the creative people are together and you take out the business people, there everybody's trying to make a good, uh, you know, good movie, good game, good everything, and they work really hard. It's the executive, the, the business people are trying to get your rights and all those things, you know. And so I, I, I it, it, it's a fascinating process. It's a lot of fun. I mean, if you get a chance to do it, it's great. But you don't know. If you get a good writer, who knows what they're going to do, and they, they can take something and create something completely new, and it'll be great. But, you know, get out of the way of the, of the creatives is the best thing we can all do. It's always going to be a risk, and it's I think seven, a seven out of ten yeah. films in Hollywood don't make money, no. and then you have those two superstars that <laughs> carry the load. 
So you try to reduce your risk, like what we've said about the script, the actors, and okay. so forth and so on. But, but you really don't know. Some of the good things that I think are happening over the last few years and why we may be seeing more successful games turn into good movies is the fact that you have young directors and producers that probably grew up with video games, so they're more into it. We've seen the expansion of stories in video games because of the technology and also the ability to improve the story. And I also think there's the partnership in some of these deals has improved a lot, at least I want to say that, where yeah. maybe the movie studio or, or the developers, you know, they, they, they let the party do their thing. And they allow them to expand the stories. You know, we used to be locked in. If I licensed a movie for a video game, I was locked into that very specific movie because the movie studio was going to take the next sequel and license it to someone else, probably. And so I think that's an, ad an advantage. And also the rights have expanded. And that has also helped expand the stories. Yeah. So I think we've seen some good success, and fortunately, the most recently, there have been incredible revenue numbers for movies released based on video games, especially uh, Super Mario that hit $1.3 billion. And interesting no enough, I looked this up, 30 years earlier when the first Super Mario Brothers <laughs> film came out, which didn't receive good ratings, surprisingly, mm -hmm. grossed about you know, $35 million. And 30 years later, it's grossing yeah. 1.3. Now, of course, that's an exception. But the, the studio goes crazy. Oh my gosh, we have a 1.3 billion. What's the language in the contract? See, we didn't negotiate against Riley. Sequel, 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 sequel. 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 We have five sequels. They've just built up an intellectual property that is they're going to yeah. continue to invest in. Because original properties, whether it's a video game or a movie, is a big investment. And yeah. you don't know if it's going to succeed or not. One thing we should touch on, uh, everything he said is absolutely right. <laughs> that's surprising. And, and one, one thing that's, that's uh, he, very true is that this, there's kind of a sea change going on. And as the new, newer studio executives come in, they're more willing to do video game and look to video games. So that's a big change. But we also have to touch on streaming because streaming typically is more, more like a television program. And there's going to be episodes. And um, I believe that you should cut those off after some amount of seasons because if something runs five years, they got to be making crap up that just doesn't, you know, you just run out of whatever story you had and you probably are not going to like it. So, you know, I always try to protect the IP, protect the IP, protect the IP, um, you know, but I've never, I've never, well, I did the I did an original Last of Us, but it was for a movie, and then it they, it evolved into. But after I left, it, it became a television series. But I hope I've never heard I of hope it. to never God heard. that they cut cut it off after two seasons because they'll just ruin it after yeah. that. <laughs> so what actually I I I, I got from uh, from today and what we have at Eleven Beat Studios, I hope we are doing it well. So basically, if you are in Poland or other country that is not accustomed to the way the deals are done in the United States, what you have to do is to be prepared. So the moment when you see th those terms and you have to agree or disagree with those terms or negotiate, it's too late for you to know which character you are developing, which character you are not developing, how are you going to divide the, the merchandise, who is going to represent you. This is all questions that you need to ask, ask yourself before you enter any negotiation, because then it's too late. Because sometimes the, the idea of making TV series or a movie from your game is so tempting that you, that you are rushing the deal instead of thinking of protecting your IP and uh, not sell it and it's not wise to sell it uh, without uh, thinking it over. I agree with that absolutely and, and all the creative people they you know they meet the produ not pr the director or whoever and they love each other and there's going to be <laughs> no problem and no, it, you don't have to worry about you know the I, you give him a list and say please tell me everything you don't want to have the character do you get one thing back you know and I'm like that's not enough guys but they never believe it right, you, know? you power, do yeah the power of hollywood, hollywood absolutely attracts right, people yeah. their eyes get big i was actually in a meeting where a pretty well known uh, film director came to our office and we had the game producer and my boss and myself and first time probably ever happened but the game producer says to the director i think your movie sucked <laughs> 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 and i guess that was the end of the conversation yeah. but anyway yeah people do get starry-eyed about yeah. movies
Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for those comments. I believe we've started a little bit uh, after uh, it we, we don't start like at, at, at the time, so we still have a few minutes. So probably there is a space for uh, for a couple of questions. So well, maybe we have some 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 questions from from the audience. Oh, I I see one guy. Yeah, so maybe I. Hi guys, uh, Kuba Jankowski from CD Projekt Red again. Uh, so I wanted to ask you because there is this history of uh, movie adaptations of video games just bombing, right? The movies being straight up not good. So what would you say is the one thing or many things that a video game lawyer or a lawyer representing a video game company can do to prevent that? Because we already mentioned, or we, you already mentioned, that there is limited um, ability in, for example, approval rights. So what can we do as video game lawyers to prevent that from happening, especially as it is very important for some companies just having one or two IPs which they are very focused on and they want to maintain the quality across the line, right? I, I just want to have one quick comment. You're not forced to do a deal with movie studios if they give you a bunch of crap. Don't do the deal. And I know it's really hard, but maybe there are situations where you walk away from a deal and hopefully there are other companies that may be interested. So I just want to make that comment. <laughs> so <laughs> pick the right partner. Uh, uh, yes. I, I, I'm on David and Riley with that, and that's what, what I wanted to say, because this actually was mentioned here, that making a movie or a TV series shouldn't be your, our goal. It should be a way to expand our IP. So if our, I, my answer to your question would be to stop being a lawyer and think about the idea behind the game, not about the business itself. So this is what I would do. If I, 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 if I were an artist and were, were to protect my right, I would say no, because it's, the goal is to expand your IP, not to dilute it. Thank you. Um, I'm Piotr from 11-Bit Studios. Hi, Tomek. Um, so the question is not for me. I mean, no, obviously <laughs> not. We talk too much. We, we talk enough. Uh, I have a couple questions, actually. One is, how important do you think the changes in sort of pre-existing audience for computer games versus film and TV? Like, in my head, it makes a ton of sense for not only creatives but business people to kind of figure out that if they're getting an IP that has a pre-existing audience of, say, 20 million people that played the game, it's in their best interest to create something that works for them, <laughs> in a sense. Sure, you, you get a producer, you get a showrunner, whatever it is, but you try to create something new, but make sure you have the core audience already there, right? Yeah, so I, think you, I think you have to have to have the core. I don't think it's a good idea ever to reproduce the video game. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah in a movie. But, but like, try and cater to the fans, in a sense. And I think that, at least in my head, the new movies and series that were created that were so successful were beloved by the fans of the games, at least for... Yeah, yeah I, think it, I think it's important to be true to the original IP so that the person who's played the game it's kind of a new experience. It's, they're not replaying the game, because if you played the game, why would you want to see the same story? But it remains true, so you get that built-in audience. But everybody who plays the game doesn't go to see the movie. In fact, probably most people who go to the movie didn't play the game. So you need, to, you, know, you need to be able to tell a story that works in a movie format, too. Awesome, thank you. And then the, qu the second question would be, do you think, and I guess it uh, touches on the point my colleague from CD Projekt made, um, do you think there are ways, I, I know you look at it from a lawyer perspective, but how much do you think uh, there is a chance for companies, because of the new generation of yeah. talent in Hollywood, to actually try and prepackage some of the creative side before they actually sign the contract? Well, the more you do, the better off you are. The question is, are you, are, is your company going to invest in movies? You know? And if you do, um, if you're willing to put up half a million dollars to get the writers and all that, that but what you find is, you, unless you're in Hollywood and you know either have 
one of the agencies or whatever, you're probably not, they're not going to take you seriously because they, you've never produced a movie. Um, I did a, a movie uh, that I got so fed up with Sony Pictures, we produced our own movie, Ratchet and Clank. And then we, but what we did is we used all the assets from the movie and we put them in the game. The movie didn't make any money, although surprisingly by today's standards, it did pretty good. Um, <laughs> But the game made a ton of money, and it was much cheaper to produce both of them than just doing one of them. So it's not a bad strategy, but it, 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 Hollywood is this little insular little world. And if you want to go get like a big star, they're not going to believe that you can produce a movie probably. You know? So you need, you need to co That's why we're doing co-production, you know, trying to bring in a big name that can get the right writers, get the right actors and actresses. So it's not easy, even for somebody like Kojima. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those questions. I believe now we use the whole hour, so it's probably time to, to, to end our panel. Uh, thank you for my wonderful guests. If you want to ask them another question, try to catch them during today's party. Thank you for your audience. <laughs>